Ladies and gentlemen, I am Twinkle the Elf, and welcome to the Chasing Meeple's Christmas Extravaganza. Ho, ho, ho! You're a good boy and you're a good girl for listening to this podcast. On today's show, Chris and Angela, they're going to be going over one of my favorite things, lists, the top five games of 2022. They're going to give you their full review of the game, Endless Winter. They brought me in to give away a game. But first, everybody's favorite, Enter. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Chasing Meeples Christmas Extravaganza. I am your host, Chris. And as always, I am with my wonderful co-host. Hello, hello. I'm Angie. Whew, I didn't think I was going to make it here on time, Angie. I didn't think you were going to make it either. <laughs> oh, time travel. <laughs> I was worried. I was worried about you for a minute. I called you and I called you. And- well, see, that's the funny thing about time and space. You don't get really good signal. Mm. <laughs> oh, so that's going to be the excuse. Yeah. Why isn't that text being picked up? Why isn't he answering? Just in the time machine. I get it. So it's really interesting. This whole time I People told- machine. The okay. the meeple machine? Oh, cheaple machine. I'll think of something. Okay. <laughs> so... It's really funny because this whole time I thought, you know, every time I listen to podcasts and somebody clicks in and they say, hey, everybody, future so-and-so here, I always thought it was just done in editing. I did not realize that literally when you create a podcast, there's some sort of weird thing that happens where time travel becomes reality and they, they monitor you. But I did talk to future Chris and he was saying something about you kind of forced him to <laughs> to come back and change things after we screwed it up that I didn't catch in editing. So well, he was forced to... You know, you need to be careful when you use the word they. It might make you sound a little bit... <laughs> well, I am a little coo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Speaking of coo hoo hoo hoo, who doesn't like a good story about Bigfoot and aliens, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to a podcast. It is uh, the last podcast on the left. I just discovered that podcast. And did you know that in 1973, apparently Philadelphia, was that Philadelphia? I got to look. New England? I don't know. Hold on a second here. You started telling me yesterday and I made you stop telling me because we're not going to talk anymore. We've decided that. <laughs> it potentially it could potentially be banter worthy. Yeah, we we're no we're no longer having conversations. It's literally just no talking until podcast. Yep. Banter. Wait, wait, wait. Is this actually going to be a good conversation? Yeah. Could it potentially be funny? <laughs> Save it. You need to stop, Chris. Stop. Stop talking. In Pennsylvania, there was a UFO Bigfoot invasion. I heard about that. Did you really? No, no. <laughs> You're so full of it. An invasion? Yeah, apparently. I mean, the Bigfoot are very, they hide. Yes. They hide. So but, how are but, they having an invasion? So it depends what school you're talking about. Right? School of so, Sasquatch school, thought. School of Sasquatch thought, yes. The University of, oh, uh, Meeple University? No, not Meeple University. No, that's kind of something else. No, Monster. No, what's the one Gabe is watching? Monsters University. Monster, there you go. Monsters University. Yeah, Monsters Inc. and all that stuff. Yeah. But no, uh, depending on what school of thought you buy into when it comes to Bigfoot, Bigfoot is either like a cryptid that is like in, in nature or it's... Never thought that the alien Bigfoot. I well, didn't like the time travel. The trans-dimensional being? Yeah. No. He doesn't seem, I mean, he's too hairy to be a trans-dimensional being. I don't, I, I really, I do have a hard time with aliens being overwhelmingly hairy. It doesn't seem right. I do not believe creatures from another planet are hairy. Interesting. I cannot have, I've, 
have you ever played Terraforming Mars? And went, you know what? Colony of Apes. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? In Terraforming Mars, there are no aliens. Wrap your head around that. Yet. Yet. Do we have the expansion? This is the expansion. This is, boom, Terraforming Mars, a dice game. I'm sure there's not going to be aliens in that. Well. But anyhow, I don't want to take up too much time talking about cryptids okay, and okay, Bigfoot. I'm sorry, even sorry, though sorry. Bigfoot is Tell the... me about the Philadelphia invasion of Bigfoot. Well, no, it was just interesting. Oh, that's it? Well, okay, so... <laughs> that's it? So there's... There were... I think it was a case of maybe mass hysteria, right? So you you gotta you gotta put your mind back into like the 1973 mindset, right? You don't have social media, you don't have all that stuff, right? But the weird thing was, is it started with there was a UFO or some sort of UFO crash, and they found like this aluminum type metal, okay? Big shock, like aluminum type metal, right? And accompanying that was a lot of UFO sightings, all right, after that happened. Then all of a sudden, somehow Bigfoot got brought into this, and there was, like, this stench that people would find, you know, and, and stink is often associated with Bigfoot. skunk ape in Florida. Well, that's also, I think skunk ape is also the different way, a uh, different term for Bigfoot. Oh, well, you know, they could right? be. But they're always saying that there's this order with Bigfoot. Well, apparently, people were seeing Bigfoots, and they were seeing aliens. And you wouldn't see... When you were seeing UFOs, you weren't seeing the Bigfoots. When you weren't seeing the the when you were seeing the Bigfoots, you weren't seeing the UFOs. So people were saying that the UFOs were dropping off the Bigfoots. And it was just like it was mass hysteria. Like the police were involved. They were getting senators involved. There was they had a hotline. It was just it was some crazy stuff. It is a really interesting story. And I am surprised that it is not told more. <laughs> but apparently, I still don't hear any invasion. When I hear invasion, I think War of the Worlds. I think of what is that one movie with the little Martian head that explodes? They all kind of land down in the town center. Mars and, attacks. Yes, emerge from their spaceship. So and, and they're all like me 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 me, and they're like we come in peace, and then they kill everybody. Now a Bigfoot invasion probably would have to do with a lot of um, loose hair. Maybe dung in the streets. Well, they did start to get... So some of the encounters tended to get a little bit violent. And that's when the police got involved. But I didn't finish listening to the whole story. So I don't know if there was full-fledged, like, boots-on-the-ground invasion, right? But needless to say, it's a really interesting story. You should check that out. I'm, I'm always a big fan of a little bit of cryptid talk here. So, yeah, so Merry Christmas. Let's talk about Bigfoot. Hey, this is the Chasing Meeples, first annual Chasing Meeples Christmas extravaganza. It is uh, it is one of my favorite times of the year, right? So doing an actual Christmas show is pretty cool. So Angie, what do you want to talk well, about? I want to... Oh, wait, that's not how you start banter. Sorry, how do I start banter? Well, we've been bantering. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have been. See, banter comes organically. Oh. We've been bantering. We've been bantering. Oh, my yeah, God. We've been bantering. I, I think the it. important thing here, and maybe at some point we can get some help with this, and since you said you like Christmas so much, that as a couple, honesty is very important, <laughs> except around Christmas, you're allowed to lie. <laughs> You're allowed to lie to the other person. But you know what? I will never, ever get over <laughs> the joke that you've played on me once that you've never tried playing on me again. Oh, but it was so good. It was not good. It was horrible. Why? It was horrible. Walmart screwed it up. So I figured oh. you thought you knew what was in the box. So I took it out of the box. What a cow plate in the box. <laughs> or my industrial sized fruit processor was supposed to be. So, all right. So there was one year Angie wanted a food processor for Christmas. Well, go big or go home, baby. Yeah, we have three people in our family, so we don't really need the big to make giant 17 cups of pesto. Oh, okay. So shame on me. I didn't know. It just looked good, so I bought it. 
I could have gotten you a tiny little food processor, yes. So I order this food processor. And this is when I wasn't like the greatest ordering stuff online person in the world. Didn't realize that they would send it in the original packaging. I assumed it would come in a box. But I also didn't realize I was getting her like this industrial size freaking food processor too. So it shows up. And I can't remember how it went. You said something about Walmart dropped off my food processor. I don't remember. Some sort of text message. And I was like, oh, I was so bummed out. So bummed out. Yeah, you were bummed out. And when I opened it, I actually expected to find a food processor. I'm digging through this giant box, taking out a newspaper and picking up what it... And you could even put something else yeah, in the I box that I would like. You stuck a plate. I put, yeah, but the funny thing was, is I, I went home, I figured out how much it weighed. So I was taking weights and putting them in there to make it weigh the same. And it was all full of nothing but newspaper. And she pulls it out. And it was, yes, it was the ugliest plate in the world that had a cow on it. What happened to that you, thing? You looked at me though. Like, isn't this so cool? And I, I like literally vomiting on the inside, <laughs> horrified that this plate is there, wondering what kind of practical joke you played. But you have this innocent, wide-eyed look, like, but this is. Don't you like it? It's, it's organic. <laughs> I thought you would like it. And I'm actually thinking, oh my gosh, he seriously thinks I'd like this. Am I supposed to put this up in the kitchen or something? <laughs> it was so horrible. What did you do with that plate? Where is it? Ah, oh, I'm sure I burned it. <laughs> it it went, it went. This was not a recycle. This was not take to Goodwill or anything. This was a dump that it is in the garbage as soon as you weren't looking. <laughs> It was so good. It wasn't. It, it was, was classic. The look on your face was <laughs> priceless. Priceless. My acting was amazing. It, oh, your acting was, yeah. I think at first you even said, well, what is that? What did they, they didn't put it in there or something like that. <laughs> it made it seem like it happened at the factory. Like of all the things the warehouse could get still. He's not going after the PS5. He's going after the food processor. It's like two kids are sitting there up high, wondering if they can mess with people. Oh, ugly ass. oh God, don't give me my ideas. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ooh. <sighs> All right. Well, I think that's enough banter for today. Oh my gosh. My side hurts. Are you ready? Are you ready for a quiz? Get your thinking cap on. Oh. I am ready. I am ready. I'm actually starting to like this quiz thing. Well, this is a pretty simple one. You know what? There's only four questions. I was three, and I turned it into four. Okay. So, you know you know what I love about this quiz stuff the most? Is that I know nothing about what she's going to quiz me. Like, for real. Oh, she will I saw not, you peeking. Only because you put it with my notes. You put your notes on top of my quiz. Well... Your your security laxed, I guess. I did. I did. I was so worried about oh, everything else. Okay. This is pop culture trivia. Once again, Chris, our subject starts out with something to do with our name, that is Chasey Meeples, and ends with a board game. Okay. I'm starting to get the hang of it. It's Alrighty. Only... In 1997. Rom-com, written and directed by Kevin Smith, stars... Do you know what a rom-com is? Yeah, romantic comedy. Yes. So it's 1997. Think I don't back. know why you said it's so weird, though. I don't know. Because I, I actually have it here on my sheet. I have 
Rom with a capital R and a C. So if I'm speaking it like this, I actually think for some reason it would say rom-com, yeah. which is not necessary. <laughs> okay. And the 1997 romantic comedy written and directed by Kevin Smith stars Ben Affleck, Joey Lauren Adams, and Jason Lee. Who the hell is Joey Lauren Adams? It's a girl. Oh, okay. I'm thinking Joey Lawrence. I, did, I didn't want to like not include her. Oh, okay, anyway. But it's a girl. Okay, so it, 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 <laughs> in 1997 romantic comedy that's written and directed by Kevin Smith. It stars Ben Affleck, Jason Lee, and Joey Lauren Adams. This is called Chasing Who? <laughs> What year was that? 1997. Chasing, I don't know who this Lauren Adam Smith is. Well, it's a girl. So now you have to be chasing something, someone, chasing. Yeah, chasing Mary. Oh, chasing, no, that's something about Mary. Hold on. (laughs) Chasing Amy. Darn you. Darn you, that's it. Was it Chasing Amy? Chasing Amy. I pulled that out of my butt. <laughs> you pull a lot of things out of your butt. Hey, hey now. Ho, oh. <sighs> I didn't think you were going to get that one. In the 1994 movie Clerks, Kevin Smith starred as what character? Silent Bob. I'm really going to have to dig deep to get the more <laughs> difficult questions than this. Because th- those were the difficult ones. Really? Because after this, this is pretty simple. Well, Chasing Amy, I guessed yeah. on. And I've never seen Clerks in my life, but I know it's like Silent Bob and something J. In 2014, a special edition of a popular game was created called Silent Bob and J Strikes Back Edition. What is the game? Okay, hold on. Give me some time to think about this. No problem. We're what, not, I'm not going anywhere. What year? 2014. It's a game that has special editions. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of games that have special editions. It's silly. Like Monopoly. It's, I'm sure it's not Monopoly, but... It's like Scooby-Doo Jenga. Yeah. I don't know. Um... Uno. <laughs> it's Monopoly. Is it Monopoly? Yes. Oh, well, Monopoly's got everything. See, that was the given. Oh, yeah, that was the given. That was the given. That was the given. That was that's the, the one given. I thought. For... The one that, yeah. No, that's the one I actually just created, so this quiz would have four questions instead of three. Okay, so I'm so far, I have two, two. and I missed one. I don't want Monopoly. I, I got that one wrong. I know, that's one you got wrong. I said Uno. Yeah. So you have two right and one wrong. And well played with the poker face when I said it was probably something like Monopoly. Thank you. Um, And what is it rated on BGG? Oh, God. I hate that you do this. 175,936. Not what it's ranked. Oh, ranked. Rated. What's it rated? Two. two. It's not that bad. It's a 6.5. It's okay. Good. What made it different? I have no idea. That's as far as I got. <laughs> oh, okay. So it, I don't my... think it makes it any different. I think instead of Park Place, it's probably like the Smoke Shack or something like that. I never. I didn't look at it. Oh, okay. Way to do your research. Well, I didn't care. I just needed to get from chasing <laughs> to a board game. Oh, okay. And that's the way I got it through. Kevin Smith. Oh, how about this? I got another question. Bonus question. Kevin Smith owns a... It's a comic book store. Forget it. Okay. So how'd I do? How'd I do? Um, you got three. No, you got two. Is the bonus question a real bonus question? Then I got three. No, you got two. You got it Chasing Amy. You got Silent Bob. Well, yeah, I threw it in there. So you got those two? Yeah, okay. Three. You got three out of five. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 
Endless Winter Paleo Americans is a 2022 board game published by Fantasia Games, designed by Stan Kordonsky with artwork by the Miko. Endless Winter Paleo Americans takes place in North America around 10,000 BCE. Players will guide the development of their tribes across several generations, from nomadic hunter-gatherers to prosperous societies. Endless Winter plays 1 to 4 in 60 to 120 minutes and is recommended for ages 12 and up. This is a worker placement game, but it does also incorporate some other mechanics, area control, deck building, and set collection. The game plays over a series of four rounds, which are broken into a daytime and an eclipse phase. Now to say this game is a table hog is putting it mildly. There is a main board, an animal board, an idol board, a terrain board, and a megalith board. Below the main board is a market display of tribe and culture cards. And lastly are the individual player boards. This may sound overwhelming, and it absolutely was the first two times I tried setting it up. But during gameplay, everything flows seamlessly. But I'm gonna take this one step at a time. So the main game board is home to the scoring track that encircles the board. There's a turn order track with the associated bonuses. A round tracker divided into a daytime and eclipse phase. The top of the board houses the sacred stones that are divided into two arrows. Finally, the most prominent and most important area of the main board, the four worker placement zones. The zones are then broken into three sections. The top section can be done multiple times as long as the cost of it can be met. While the action in the middle section can only be performed once, the action in the bottom section is a one-time bonus for the first player that takes this action. So what are the worker placement zones, you ask me? Angie, what are these worker placement zones? The first worker placement zone is the initiate action. In the top section, a player will spend one tool and one labor to take a single face-up tribe card and put it straight into their hand. This is important in deck building, because most of the time you take a card and you have to discard it right away. Um, you can put this into your hand so you can then immediately use it. In the middle section, you may spend a food and take a tribe card, but this one you're gonna place directly into your discard pile. And then you may bury a card underneath your burial cap. The bottom section allows you to gain one idol and bury a card. Now before I move into the second zone, what is burying a card, huh? In your starting deck of cards, you are also given a burial cap card. When you bury a card, you will place it underneath the burial cap that's below your player board. So why do you want to bury a card? This is a concept I've struggled with, but by burying a card it has two benefits. The first is the end game points. And the second reason is that it allows a player to thin their deck of unwanted cards. When you get to gain one idol, this refers to the idol board. Um, you have an idle board and it's divided into two tracks. On the left side is an offering track. This track will give you end game points based on your leftover resources. The right side of the track is called the honor track. These are gonna give you end game points based on the number of cards under that burial cap we just talked about. So when you gain an idol, you're gonna move up one step on either one of those tracks you get to decide. On to the second worker placement zone. This is the development. In the top section here, you're gonna spend three labor to buy a culture card that you put straight into your hand. The middle section action is to take a sacred stone, but you have to pay the related cost that's gonna be listed on your player board. The bottom section of the development zone is to gain one food and one tool. The third worker placement zone is migrate. In the top section of the migrate action, a player spends one tool and they'll place a camp from their player board onto the base terrain tile of the terrain board. Now at the start of the game, all players begin with one camp already on that base glacier hex. Then you may spend one labor to move one of those camps to an adjacent hex on the terrain board. Yet another board, Angie. The terrain board is not exactly a board, but it is made up of hexagonal tiles that represent six different land types, as well as glacial tiles. And they are all placed at random and surround a glacial base. Fourth and final worker placement zone is the hunt action. In the top section of the hunt action, the player can spend one tool 
and then take two cards from the top of the animal deck and place them face up in the hunting grounds. If a player chooses, they may spend one labor and one tool to take any animal card from those hunting grounds and place it face up in the animal area under their player board. In the middle section, you may tip one animal from the animal area and then gain the immediate benefit shown on the card. So when you tip an animal, you are merely turning it on its side. This is gonna signify that you've killed this animal and it can no longer be used for set collection purposes at the end of the game. The bottom section bonus is to take the top card of the animal deck and place it into your animal area of the player board. The next board you need to understand is the megalith board. It's made up of four small modular boards and can be placed in different configurations. When you place tiles on the megalith board, you gain different benefits, a food or tool resource, as well as cards. It can also give you gain points if you stack the monolith tiles. Now, below the main board, you have a display of cards. The first row are the tribal cards. These are your fellow tribe members that are gonna help with your labor costs. Below that is the market row of culture cards. Culture cards have several different benefits and may also have end game points. Like the sacred stones are, these cards are divided into two eras, represent the time you spend building your tribal community. For the first two rounds of the game, you will use the era one cards. And then during rounds three and four, you use the era two culture card. And finally, your player board. The player board includes a food and tool resource track. It is home to five camps and three villages, your 10 megalith tiles, and three spaces for your sacred stones. In the top corner of the board, there is a placement spot for the rest action. Along with everything else, each player has a starting deck of cards, two tribe meeples, and one chief miniature, which gives each player three turns in a single round. On a player's turn, you complete the following steps in order. One, you play culture cards if you have them. Second, place a figure in one of the four placement zones and perform the actions. This can include the rest action on your player board. So if you decide to do this, you place your figure on the rest area on your board, which is on the corner, top corner. You draw one card and tip one animal. Third, you discard any cards that you played. And fourth, and this fourth part is only gonna happen on your third turn, you're going to prepare the Eclipse Pile. The Eclipse Pile will determine the new turn order for the next round. Each player puts a number of cards into their pile. The pile with the most labor hands will win. You would then proceed to the new round, but if you've just completed the fourth round, proceed to final scoring. Now it's time to determine who has the most prosperous tribe. Players should receive points from the offering track, the honor track, any tribe cards in their hand or discard pile, and lastly, points from the non-tip animal cards. Player with the most points wins, and this is a brief overview of Endless Winter. Well, Angie, that was a really good overview of what Endless Winter is. Thank you. I worked hard on it. So I'm really glad that you pointed this out in your overview of the game is how much of a table hog the game can be. So I just want to, before we go any further, I just want to get it out of the way. The game needs a very big table. We play all of our games in our kitchen on an oval kitchen table. It's not a game table. It's nothing big. And it takes up a lot of room. But I can imagine that even people with game tables, even people with big square tables have a hard time fitting it all on there. And we have just two people playing. Can you imagine how much oh, the real estate? Oh, the player boards for three. Oh, my goodness. Now, I do think, you know, and, and another drawback to that is, you know, so big, big screen or big screen, big, big real estate, right? It looks pretty good when it's on the, when it's on the table. But I think, I think once you get over the shock of how big the game is and sprawling it is out on your table. Mm -hmm. The other drawback to the game is, I think, setup time. And I don't know if that was just because we're not familiar with how to set up the game, so it's not like a natural thing to us yet. But I feel like setup time on that game takes, this game takes a long time. Let me ask you a question, Chris. Yes. How much setup time did it take you 
zero, but this isn't a review of me. <laughs> this is a review of you. I mean, of the game. <laughs> I mean, of the game. So seriously, like, it took a while to get the game set up. And that was, it It feels like with the, the neoprene mats. The neoprene mat makes a difference. It is much simpler to set up. Things stay in their place. There is a spot for everything. Um, the mat makes a big difference, but the inserts of this game are are phenomenal. And it, that makes a big difference between the first time I tried setting it up and this last time I tried setting up because you had to get everything in. It's There's a place for everything with this game. And once you have everything in its place, it really is much quicker than what it was the first time. So, yeah. So, like, you know, I guess what I, I just, I had to get that out of the way before I wanted to go any farther. With all of the space that it takes up, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not an overly complex game. And so what I'm trying to say is... This game packs a bunch of mechanics into one game. One game. All these different mechanics. But the cool part is, is that after after your first play, it all makes sense. So you're looking at this and you're just like, oh, wow. So there's this monolith. There's worker placement. There's hand management, deck building. And what's really cool is all of the mechanics in this game mesh well and each part is essential to how the game flows so it's not like they just threw everything together and said all right we're just going to do this we're going to do that it all makes sense you can definitely feel that that they really put a lot of time and effort when they were play testing this game because everything just seems to work what do you think Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. So what's one of your favorite things? So what's one of your favorite things about about the mechanics? About the mechanics. What's your favorite mechanic? Like what's your favorite part of the game? What's your favorite part of the game? My favorite part of the game is that once you build up your deck and you start to get more of those culture cards mm -hmm. and more of your what what is that called? Uh, what's the other cards? The tribe. Tribe cards. You have the ability to, if you play, if you if you can manage your resources, there's a lot of cool combos that you can do. I mean, you could just, bam, I want to play this card. Bam, I want to play that card. And then that's going to give you the ability, once you play those cards, now all of a sudden, now I'm going to, now it's the worker placement phase. Now mm -hmm. these cards gave me the ability, gave me all these extra resources, gave me this and that and now I'm doing my, my action phase, my worker placement phase, and now I can, in the infinity part, I can keep going and keep going and keep going. And I think if you, I think that's what's really cool. I think everything is very seamless in the game. I don't think there is anything that is a wasted move. Mm -hmm. Each one of the actions, the worker placement action, I think are all very equally valuable um, to get your culture cards, get your tribe cards. You have to go, you know, to different spots to get your food. So there's four, there's four main worker phases, and this is what we talked about in the overview. But each one of them are very valuable to be able to combine those culture cards to have that that's almost an engine. I don't really ever think of this as an engine building game, but to get those cards, to be able to play those cards, you did that very, very well. Um, so I don't think there's a weak spot, and I think that the fact that all these worker placement areas are very strong. I do have one issue with, and in my head, I'm trying to keep it straight because I'm not sure if it's a mechanic or it's part of, because this is a very big theme. You're going through this very large life cycle of this Paleo-American tribe. And as I started thinking about something, going very in depth with my mind, and don't let me sit alone for too long because I start thinking about things. 
I started thinking about how this mechanic is working thematically and would this actually be accurate? And I don't know if mechanically, if this is the place to talk about it. After we're done with our review, do we do it when we talk about the theme? So I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you, but actually mentally torn. When do I say what's on my mind, Chris? No time better than now. Okay. I like all the mechanics. I like all the mechanics. There is a portion of the game, which is the terrain board. On the terrain board, you will have your, you have your camps, which are little tents. They move on to the hexes. Once you have a hex, a camp on each of three hexes that are adjacent to each other, you can place a village. The camps will gain you one influence. The villages gain two. Now, when Chris and I play, we play with two people, so our board is not very tight. The whole point about going through these actions, and that is the development action of building yourself up so you can take area control of your of this little uh, three hex, you know, like grid area, and you're building your village, you can have that influence or dominance of that area taken away from you with one move by your opponent. And it seems somehow counterintuitive that if you are a tribe, if I build my home, For some reason, my neighbor wants to camp in my backyard, and I'm a nice enough person to say, well, okay, okay, you know, they're just camping. I'll let them, I'll let them go, let them walk through, whatever. And then my neighbor decides to come in and use my bathroom. And then the neighbor invites his friend and his sister's friend, and they, they park their RX-7 from Texas in the backyard and start to assert dominance on the village you built. It's like some sort of squatter thing. And somehow it seems like you got some sort of squatter rights now. There's something thematically about that mechanic that does not seem to work for me. Emotionally. And is that why this was the very first time we ever played a game? And you were, you literally dropped an F-bomb. And you've never dropped an F-bomb in the middle of a game before. When we were counting up points. I, I, no, I, I, I explicitly said we were not going to discuss this on the podcast. But you brought it up. No, 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 no. I, in discussing my review <laughs> of the mechanics slash theme together, and this is my thought, this is my review of that mechanic. Okay. Doesn't with make that sense. theme and how I don't feel that mechanic... If it's if that's even a, me if a mechanic, but that's, that's a part mechanic. of the area, it's area control. control mechanic. Oh, that area control is working with that theme. I'm thinking somebody who is Paleo American. This is something who is tribal. That's what it is. Are going to assert much more dominance and probably, oh, I don't know, throw a spear to the back of the person in the tent. That's just my opinion. I don't know. Paleo Americans maybe a little bit more passive um yeah otherwise i love the game <laughs> awesome love the art by love the art by the well, nico oh, oh, uh, holy cow really really i really love that game i certainly i really i have it is a spot on excellent worker placement game it works seamlessly it does it flows it's intuitive you know there are four spots you know when you take this action it's going to go over to the train board. It's going to go over to the animal board. So all these boards and the markets all seem very overwhelming. But once you put it together, it flows. Mm -hmm. And this does not become, it does not seem like a heavy game once you start playing it. So if you want to bring somebody else into it, you don't give them a box and say, hey, look, at I got this game for you. You'll love it. No. Then you'll have somebody poop in their pants. You bring them over. Have it set up, said, hey, you know, grab your snacks, whatever. Sit down, let me show you this game. Because you'll be able to teach it pretty simply. You know, it'll be a little bit more difficult if they've never played a board game before, if they've never played a strategy board game before. Mm -hmm. 
but I think people pick it up very easily, and I think it's elegant. It is an elegant game. Yeah, so it, I, I agree with you when you say the game is elegant. I mean, in reality, the turn actions are very straightforward. I mean, literally, you just play a card, you get rewards from that card, or it gives you more actions. You know, Then you place your worker in one of the four spots, choose one of the three actions in the spot, and then get the reward, right? It's literally very simple. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, there's more to it than that, but those are just the basics. There's two phases each round and four rounds total in the game. And after the fourth round, you add up your points and that's the winner, right? So the phases that you have is your your day phase, if you want to call it that. I can't remember what it's called, the action phase and the eclipse phase. And Angie, you did a fantastic job explaining them in the overview. So I don't want to dwell too much on the mechanics of the, the, but I want to talk about that a little bit. The eclipse phase was probably the most confusing part of the game for me. And it, it's, it sounds stupid when I say it, but because it really is simple. You play your cards and whatever heart cards you have left over, if they have an eclipse symbol on it, you put it in your eclipse deck or eclipse pile and then you, you play your cards, right? You don't have to do that. You don't have to. But you're depending whether you want to fight for that first player marker, which to me, which that's the important right. thing, that first player. So I think I always forget the importance of the eclipse phase. And the last time we played, you were first player the whole game. Hmm. So it was a little, I guess I didn't. Yeah, but I lost. Mm-hmm. That's just because I was comboing everything and had control of the map and figured out how to do the no, but monolith to me, game. The important thing about the first player, because I think the first game I played, I didn't really pay attention to it because mm-hmm. when the board is so wide open, uh, we do have enough spots that we're not stepping on toes. Um, that being said, though, because the turn order track gives you benefits, whether it's a card, whether it's a tool, whether it's a meat, you can choose the benefit that you think you're going to need best based on where you are in the turn order track. But the only person that can take the monolith action is the first player. Mm -hmm. And there are not a lot, there is not a worker placement spot on the board that gives you a monolith action. So there's only a few places that give you a monolith action. Right. You can get it through one of your culture cards, Mm -hmm. which you did grab the ones with the monoliths on them. Yeah, I could Um, tell I was bothering you too. I wasn't hate drafting. No, no, no. No, that didn't bother me. You just got that card, and I realized when you grab, because there's, what, eight cards out there? And they're all pretty good. They all have very good benefits. There aren't really any weak cards. But out of those eight cards, when you grab the one with the megalith that I wanted, I'm like, that's where your mind is. Your mind is mm-hmm. going over to that megalith track, which I really got a lot of points from that game before. Yeah. So I know this in your mind is like, okay, this is something I need to look That's at. That's why I was doing it, yes. So like I said, there's only so many places to get that megalith action. Then one place is, is that first player marker there, the first turn benefit. So you have to get the first. That was the only reason why I'd ever concentrate on being first player because I never would really worry too much about it. But I saw you going after that megalith, and I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really think there's much more to say about mechanics, unless there's anything you want to add. No. No, no. pretty good. Good. So what do you think about the art of the game? Um, the art of the game, the Miko does some incredible art. Mm-hmm. I am a big fan. We have talked about the, we're going to sound like a, I don't know what, do, I don't know what the word is. We're, you know, like a broken record. Cause we talk about the West Kingdom trilogy, Shem yeah. Phillips games. This is the Miko. Mm-hmm. Um, he does art for. Claim. There's another game too. Imperial. Oh, yeah, Legends? he did do that. Yeah, Imperial Legends, I think. Yeah. I think that's what it's called, yeah. His artwork pops. It is, and it, I didn't know, you know, at one point I'm thinking, are these different artists using the same 
the same, uh, well, I don't even know what you call it, the style. It is a style, but it is very unique. And in my mind, I'm thinking, is this becoming the new, this is so strange, but the new anime, Mm -hmm. the square jaw, Mm -hmm. almost, penciled square jaw, I don't know how else to describe it. But I realized, no, this is him doing this artwork for these different games. And I love his art. Yeah. Um, to me, that is one thing that drew me onto this game. It looked at that, and I'm like, oh, okay, sure. America. I'm like, oh. So to me, that that drew me into the game. Mm-hmm. His art, I think, is very, very good. Yeah, Fantasia Games, you know, bleh. Yeah, his artwork just gets you into that theme. I, it just, his art style, it just pops for me, and it really has a way to mm-hmm. suck me into the theme. I like you mentioned the West Kingdom and his artwork just doesn't ever disappoint me. Um, you know, a little bit about components. Fantasia Games did a great job with the components. Um, this the, was the first game. Did you know that? No, I didn't. This was the first game they published. Very cool. Well, it, yeah. They knocked it out of the knocked park first time park. around, right? It is amazing. Yeah, the detail on the cards and the boards and the just all the components are great. All the player pieces, they're colorful. The the minis, they are so sweet looking. Mm-hmm. They're just, uh, they're good. Yeah, the game inserts. Uh, the inserts are good. The recessed player yes. boards. So you you literally just, that was next on my list of things to talk the about. Recessed player board. <laughs> Dual layered player boards. That literally needs to be a thing in all games going forward. I've... Yeah. 2023, if there's anything that all game companies need to start doing, recessed or dual layered player boards should just be standard. 100%. Yeah. You don't know how happy I get every time I see that. <laughs> yeah. Like, ooh. Anything else about the art? I think that's it. Perfection. So we can talk about the theme a little bit. What do you think about the theme? We we spent a good time, I think, mixing the theme and the mechanics together. Yeah. So I don't really think there's much does more. Does the we theme can... come through to you? It does. Okay. Hundred percent. So, what really caught my eye when I backed the game was the art looks the art style looked neat, mm-hmm. but the theme. So, you know, I like survival. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, the, the best survival game out there, Ignacy Chevacek's Robinson Caruso. Uh-huh. Um, and I got, I just, I really like that man versus nature, trying to survive, yeah. doing all that. And that's what really pulled me in on this, is that okay. is, is that theme. Yeah, that's uh, and the epitome of it is surviving. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I love the theme. And it does pull me in, artwork. Uh, the fact that they came up with a digital soundtrack for it which we were playing the other day oh, was when that? I was playing that Where? that that music that was the endless winter soundtrack I think that the way that the theme carries through is not just the artwork but it moves through that terrain board what are you doing mm-hmm. what are the what is that tribe doing at that point they are trying to expand their tribe mm-hmm. uh, what are they doing with the culture cards they are you know expanding their culture the animal board they're going to have to go out they're going to have to hunt. They're going to have to kill. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to eat to survive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, creating those megaliths. What did you always, cave paint, you always see that where you, you know, worship your God, put yourself here, make the world known. This is where I was first. Mm-hmm. So all that, that, the, that theme shines through. It does. And, you know, I like that, you know, you mentioned the hunting the animals, right? So I like how... I like how you can collect the animals and save them as as points for the game. A collection right there. But if you need them, you better tip that animal and get that meat and that resources for it because but you know that's not resources even, are scarce. And it it it's not a bad thing because there was a sacred stone and I don't think if you I didn't grab it. I don't know if you knew it was up there that you got in game points based on your tipped animals. No, I didn't notice that one. So I mean I had noticed that. But I couldn't pay for it at the time. Mm-hmm. That was that action that you have to be able to pay for them. And yeah. sacred stones, depending on how many you get, once you get to that second one, they're starting to get pricey. Yeah. And that's yeah. what they're called? They're called sacred stones? 
Yeah. I thought they were called tablets, but okay. Sacred, Sacred Stones, Stones makes sense. Yeah. Same thing. So, that is the one thing in the game that I'm still trying to map out in my head and how I can play that into my strategy are those stones. To me, it's like the basics. The I, I got one last time we played, mm -hmm. and I think it was literally just... I don't remember what it was. It depends on which ones come out, because the ones coming <laughs> out might not have anything to do with... You know, you could take one... At, early in the game but if you're not really going to go if the terrain tiles yes. aren't similar if you don't think you're going to be able to get a village there then you have you're paying for a sacred stone that's going to give you two yes. points per village you have at the end of your round well that I, might not be like the tipped animal one yeah. though was much better that might have been an era two one though but points based on tipped animals now you know you're probably going to have a few tip downs because you need the meat. Yep. So. I look at those sacred stones as almost the same thing as the, I'm going to probably call them wrong thing, but the yellow tiles, the knowledge tiles in Castles of Burgundy. Okay. I don't use those often. If you ever, if you remember when we play Castles of Burgundy, I do not use those tiles often. It, well, it's just because they're so hard to read and figure <laughs> out, and you're always referring back and forth to the book. Well, that, but, but those can also be really ways that you can grab some points. Yeah. You know, so to just, it, and that's one of the things about a Euro game is trying to make everything work together. And you can't always do everything. I try to do everything. I can't. But that's you, a big problem of mine. You bring up an, another really good point. You kept talking about the flow of the game. All the iconography in this game works. It is so good. Oh, yeah. There is no problem. Like Castles of Burgundy, you're always looking in the book. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, yeah. They did a great job with this. Yeah. So... So it's last but very not, intuitive. It's it yeah. is it is it is intuitive, right? Yeah. So again, a lot of time must have went into play testing this, and Stan, you know, he's a darn good, darn good designer too. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's talk about rep replayability. What do you think? I think it depends on you as a gamer. I enjoy Euro games. Mm -hmm. Which, by and large, do not change much from game to game. You different cards might come out, different, you know, different chits or something like that. Sorry, um, but there isn't this big change from game to game. If you're somebody that really needs that, you might find it just might find that you won't pull for it a lot. I disagree. I think when it comes to a Euro type game, which this definitely is, mm -hmm. I think the game it has such an open world type feel to it. Yeah. That there is a lot of variability in strategy and that you can, that, that even just in the base game. Now we haven't even touched any of the expansions. I think if you add the expansions to it, you're going to have way more options on how you can play that game that that is going to make almost every game you play different than a than than each other never get never the same i really i really do think so that's my opinion on that and that's your and opinion that's good that's a good opinion i appreciate your opinion good i think there is a lot of replay in this game i really do I'm not saying that there's not replay value in it. What I'm saying is if you are a... If you're not a Euro gamer, I don't know if somebody who is some somebody that's used to like real quick punchy mm -hmm. games, if they're really going to want to... I don't know. I'll play it, but I like that type of game. Mm -hmm. All right. So as far as a rating, I would definitely rate this a 7.5 out of 10 and shuffle it back into my deck. What about you? 
Really? Yes. I'm going to say that it's a nine. Ooh. The only reason I will not give this game as a 10 is because of the my problem with the with the tents and the camps mm -hmm. and the train board. And the only reason I gave it a 7.5 is because I feared for my life when we played it because of the tents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, you know, I don't really like area control as a mechanic, mm -hmm. but feeling that through with the theme and stuff like that, that's my reason. The only thing that I'm not giving it a 10. So I, do, I do love this game. I really do. Good. And it is. It would be, without that, if it, that wasn't an issue, it would be a 10. All righty. So now in the Chasing Meeple's Christmas extravaganza episode. We're going to talk about our top five games from the year 2022. I will go first. My first honorable mention is Flamecraft, published by Cardboard Alchemy. They had an awesome Kickstarter, and Lucky Duck Games picked up the major distribution of it, so they're publishing it now. It's a one to five player game. You take on the role of flame keepers who gather resources, place their dragons and help out the shopkeepers in town by casting enchantments to improve the shop. It's a great game. The art is charming and the gameplay is simple. You go to shop, collect goods, activate cards and play a card. Or you go to the shop and score an enchantment and then activate any or all cards. The simplicity still leaves the player with a lot of choices. So it sounds simple, but you still have a lot of choices. Can offer a deep thinky game if you want. It's a great game, but it did not make it into my top five. Angie, what about your next? Well, your why don't honorable? you do your next one? Because I think I did these differently than you did. All right. So my next honorable mention is going to be a game that we literally just picked up a couple weeks ago, but I enjoyed playing it so much that it has to be on here. And that is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation by Funko, published by Funko. Push your luck, roll your dice, and try to get rid of all your holiday troubles. You got to get that elusive Christmas bonus. But hey, Angie, watch out for Cousin Eddie because <clears throat> his shit's already full and he wants to clog up your plans. <laughs> Hey, do you have what it takes to have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas of all? It's simple, it's fun, and it's exciting. It's just too new for me to add to the list. But my God, did I have fun with that. Well, that was a good game. That was a good game. My honorable mentions are ones that I was originally going to put on my list, and then I realized they did not come out in 2022. They were actually 2021 games. So these would have been on my list had I not realized that they were not, um, two, there were 2021 games. So my first one is Arc Nova. It is a game by Freulenspiel. Freulenspiel? I'm not sure. It's about building a modern zoo with scientific conservation. This game is represented by Tetris style pieces. Um, we have cards that are depicting animals, scientists, zoologists. And some of the cards have conservation on them. It has an interesting action selection mechanism. Each player has five action cards. You can build an enclosure, buy an animal, um, you do an association, a sponsor action, or you can buy cards. Um, each of these actions have a different worth based on what slot it is on your player board. Once you've used that action, Everything slides up, and that position slides to the back. I don't know if there's a mechanic, if there's a name for that. It's the slide action, <laughs> where this action's worth a lot, and then it goes backwards, and now it's not worth as much. I, the slide action. Slide like action. It. We're just going to call it that. The slide mechanic. So that I've just <laughs> named that. Card slide. Uh, let BGG know it's called the slide mechanic. Um, my next game is Llama Land, designed by Phil Walker Harding. You Once again, you're using uh, the Tetris-style tile-laying game. In this one, you're building a pasture for your llamas. 
Um, you're going to gain points from gathering sets of cards. You gain points from the scoring conditions at the beginning of the game. And the, one of the really things I really, 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 really love about this game is that the llama meeples. And when you're building your pasture, you're building it upwards as well as out. So that's really cool because you're stacking all the tiles on top of each other. Llama Land, if Llama Land wouldn't have been a 2021 game, it would have made my list for sure. I find it really interesting that two of your honorable mentions, though, are the polyomino tile placement games. I like those type of games. I don't think they're normally, they're no, those normally aren't your favorite type of games, are they? Um, uh, I will get into it later, but it, it can be difficult. Yeah. Sometimes that's spatial, the spatial awareness, spatial thinking mm-hmm. of it, and it depends on the placement of them, yeah. how you're having to place them on things. With you know, the way you place them in the zoo is different the way you're placing tiles on llama land or where mm-hmm. you have to place tiles in yeah. patchwork. So it depends on it's really dependent on the um, placement rules. So, what do you think? How many crossovers are we going to have? Oh, I think we're going to have a lot. I think we're going to have a lot. Since huh? we have all these same games. Oh, okay. And we play most of them at home. So let's say I'm going to say, hey, uh, I'm going to say three. You're going to say? Tre- I'm going to say three crossovers. Oh, three. Three. Uh, oh, I say tree. tree. I think we're going to have a uh, tree as well. Okay. Yeah. But, but what tree it is? I don't know. Oh, tree it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Tree. That's Wisconsin talk for you guys, by the way. Number five. My number five is Long Shot the Dice Game. Number one. Strategize and push your luck in a tense race of eight horses. And during the game, you buy horses, you place bets, you influence the race movement, and each horse has special abilities. You roll your dice, and it determines which horses move and the options available on each turn. So be ready to adapt your plans. Once three horses cross the finish lines, earnings are totaled, while there are many ways to earn money during a horse race. Only the player that makes the most money will be declared the winner. So this is a good game that I think will appeal to most people. If they can get past that it's not the easiest to learn, but it is easy to play once you understand the rules, if, if you can wrap your head around what I just said. So I don't think the iconography is the greatest. I think when Angie and I first played it, it took a lot of time for us to understand exactly what we needed to do. By all means, it's a it's pretty much a roll and write game, right? Um, but the funny thing about it is, is there's an element of this game that I think makes it more of a party game than a roll and write game. So if you get the chance to play this, I recommend it. Long Shot the Dice Game, my number five. My number five is Ten Penny Parks. Ten Penny Parks is a one to four player tile lane worker placement game about creating a theme park in the humble town of Fairfield. A game of Ten Penny Parks is played over five rounds called Month. Each month, players take turns placing workers on the game board to take actions like removing trees, building concession stands, and attractions represented by polyamino tiles, and buying more property to make their theme parks attractive to visiting people as much as possible. At the end of each month, rewards are given to the player with a park that best exemplifies thrill, awe, and joy. After the fifth month, the player with the most VP wins. I enjoy the worker placement decisions and the tile lane, although this gives me a little bit of crazy AP. This is the tile lane game that does... I like it, but every time I I have such anxiety about it... Um, it's so funny that I can be laying a tile and I'll be looking at the board going, is this the best place to place it? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I, I, oh, I can't place it. It just gives me a little bit of anxiety, but I love the game. The other thing I really like about it is that it's got a very unique way 
when you buy your attractions, all the attractions are laid out on cards, um, which are also then represented by the tiles. Each card has a cost, but that cost is going to be altered based on your carousel. You turn um, the carousel is the main thing in the board. You turn the carousel. There are different spots on it that said one dollar plus one dollar plus two minus one. So your price, you could have a seven dollar attraction. If it's facing the wrong spot in the carousel, you might have to pay nine dollars for it. Um, so it's, it's a very, I like that. That's something very different. I don't think I've ever we really played anything like that. But I, I enjoy it a lot. It's by Thunderworks Games. Um, this is a Wisconsin company, which always makes me happy. Uh, yeah, Ten Penny Parks, my number five. Number four. My number four is Return to the Dark Tower. Published by Restoration Games. So this game is a revision of the legendary 1981 Milton Bradley electronic board game called the name the dark called the Dark Tower. I want to go back in time with you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> The year 1973. I was in my bedroom and my best friend was at my window holding up the game The Dark Tower outside my window, dancing, saying, nah, 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 nah. I got it. Guess what? You're not going to play with it. No. Close. No. Close. It would be pretty awesome if that was what it was. <laughs> But it was 1973, you had it all. It was all a good story until you said 1973. Oh, that was the first thing I said. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still a good story. No. I just want to go back in time a little bit. So I've always wanted to play that game. I had a friend who owned it, but would never let anyone play it. And part of me suspects that it's because he didn't know how. <laughs> Because he always said it. It could have been. Could have been. But I've always wanted to play it. And I'm pretty sure that when they launched this campaign, it was definitely, definitely geared towards people that were in their late 40s. So I backed the campaign as soon as, as, soon as it launched. When it's on your table, the presence is stunning. That tower is just, oh, it's there. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And it's it's freaking intimidating. It's an app, it's an app driven game that gives you that that epic dungeon crawl type of experience. It's the best way I can describe it. It's like a dungeon crawl. And I haven't had a bad experience with this game yet. So 46 years later, my inner child can finally say he got to play it. And you should too. Return to the Dark Tower. Restoration Games. My number four. My number four is Trekking History. Trekking History is a one to four player game published by Underdog Games. It plays in 35 to 45 minutes and it's on the lighter side of light to medium weight games. It follows in the line of trekking games like Trekking the National Parks and Trekking the World. In Trekking History, you're taking a three-day tour of history trying to complete the longest timelines, visiting crucial points in history. You visit a location using a certain number of hours. And by gaining power crystals, you can alter the hours and extend your day to gain additional steps. The longer your trek, the more points you gain. I hope they add an extension to this one day. But what would be better, Chris? I would hope they would add an expansion to this one day. An extension? No. I hope they add an expansion to this game one day to make it a little bit more complex. But I like it. I really do. It's a fun game. It's a relaxing game. It's a charming game. That's my number four, Trekking History. 
So my number three is Endless Winter by Fantasia Games. So let me tell you, this game probably would have been number one on my list. And it's not a knock on the game. The game is great. We reviewed the game. So you don't need me to talk any more about it. So I'm going to move on. My number three, Endless Winter. My number three is Creature Comforts. Uh, Creature Comforts is a one to five player game from the Kids Game Table. It is a medium weight game that plays in about 45 minutes. In Creature Comforts, you are woodland creatures going through the seasons, preparing for winter in a lighthearted worker placement game. You try to gather the right supplies to create a crazy... No, no, you try to gather the right supplies to create a cozy home, Chris. Not a crazy home. You want a cozy home for your family through the winter. I love the cards that represent the board games here. Um, you have a deck of cards. You're, all, you're trying to... It's like a contract fulfillment almost. Um, you're just trying to make sure you have the right resources to buy the cards, to make some sets for in-game points. But the cards are so cute and they have... Because they have all the things that you're going to need for winter. They have somebody knitting mm -hmm. or a rocking chair, but they have board games. And I thought that card, and you always get the one with the board games on there. They has a little picture of Everdale on it and stuff. I think it's so cute. It's because I always go um, for it. <laughs> as soon as I see it, I'm like, oh, Everdale. <laughs> That's why I never get it. Uh, the fact that it is so simple, but yet it's still thinky and adorable. And this game, believe it or not... Um, I find to be a, I don't want to say it that way. Flamecraft is not on my list. So for cute creatures, worker placement, I prefer creature comforts. And I'm going to leave it at that. That's why it's my number three. Number two. My number two is Trekking Through History. Published by Underdog Games. So in this game, you're taking a three-day tour of human history. Traveling thousands of years in a time machine to experience great moments from our past. This game takes place over three rounds, each representing one day of your trip. On each turn, you choose to visit one historical event and spend a certain number of hours doing it. Doing so will yield benefits, like checking off items on your itinerary for points and earning time crystals. So you can bend the time-space continuum on future turns. <laughs> Basically, the player with the most points after three rounds wins. So if you're looking for a beautiful gateway level game... I think this is a good gateway game. Yeah. I think it is, because I do think it, and it's going to appeal to people who are not gamers yeah yeah it, this is definitely it if you're looking for a gateway game right it's a i think it is i think it is tracking through history it's easy to play but still gives you plenty to think about you know you want to maximize the length of your treks mm -hmm. and that's how many cards you have in your tableau basically mm -hmm. and not only that there's the puzzle of trying to finish your itinerary so it's a quick game with a cool time-traveling theme. In my opinion, this one is fantastic. Check it out. My number two, Trekking Through History. My number two, I've gone back and forth. I went back and back and back and forth between one and two. This was a hard one for me. This was a hard one for me. My number two is Endless Winter. I could not put it at number one because I had to think about how I feel when I played it. And so it evoked a lot of passion. It evoked a lot of passion out of me. And I had to decide, is that so good that it evokes that feeling out of me that it should be number one or not? So it landed at number two. Endless winter. Number one. 
Well, Angie, yes, my, <laughs> my number one is your number five. Ten Penny Parks by Thunderworks Games. So in this game, you're building a theme park trying to make your customers happy. That's literally what you're trying to do is make your customers happy. And you did a really good job explaining it, so I'm not going to waste everybody's time explaining it again. But what I really like about it is it's uh, it, it's a polyomino tile placement and worker placement, and it creates... It's, it's charming, but like I'm <laughs> watching you... It's definitely AP inducing to certain people. So you place your workers to take an action, but there's a twist. And that twist is the tile placement action and rides and shop may not touch each other. And that is where you struggle. And it is such a unique take on it. That's the only polyomino game that we have that, that has that placement rule. And I like it. I like it a lot. So this creates a dilemma for players as they have to try to utilize the space in their park to the best of their abilities. And watching you sweat over that is just, it's fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? What? It is challenging. And at the end of the day, it's very satisfying when everything yes. fits, right? When yes. everything fits, it's satisfying. Yes, 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 it is. It plays in quick five rounds. It was lighter than I expected it to be the first time we played it. Yes. I was expecting it to be a little bit more, but that, that doesn't mean that it's a filler game. No. Right? It's still got something to it. What's cool about it, first time designer Nate Linhart, he did a great job for his first, yeah, first absolutely. game. And... uh Another winner by Thunderworks Games. Ten Penny Parks, my number one. Um, did you peek at my my thing over here? I didn't know your list. Yeah. No, why you would might I do be that? Surprised. Okay, I'm ready to be. What do you surprised. think my number one is? What do I think your number one is? Yeah. Holy moly! I think it's Marvel Dice Throne. She stands up, drops her stuff, and walks out of the room. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? Oh my God, I'm so right. Oh, I gotta learn to stop. I gotta learn to stop guessing good, I guess, apparently. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh god are you done are you coming back what's going on here <laughs> oh oh <laughs> i'm dying here are you coming back i wasn't <laughs> <laughs> was i right Yes, you're right. <laughs> yes, you're right. Right there. What the heck? Of all games, why? I want to hear your explanation of that. I am not editing any of this out either, by the way. This ten minutes of you laughing. Ten minutes of me dying. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I don't. <sighs> I don't know if I can take it. I don't. I seriously. I seriously for chasing Amy. No, this. Oh God. Oh, God, this is my magic year. I have not been this right about a lot of stuff since the time I guessed you got me a freaking Kindle. Oh, 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 oh. oh I got to buy oh, a lottery ticket. That tonight. was painful. Don't remind me. Oh. That. Don't remind me of that. <sighs> oh, I have to wrap a Kindle box for your Christmas. Oh, my God, I got to mute my mic. I seriously, my... I'm dying here from laughing so hard. I got to mute my mic. It's all yours. My number one is Marvel Dice Throne and Santa versus Krampus. So there you go. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a cheat because I'm kind of throwing it in as all the Marvel Dice Thrones. Um, but let's see. Here we go. 
Marvel Dice Throne, published by Roxley Games. Marvel Dice Throne is the latest iteration of the characters in the Dice Throne universe, with characters like Captain Marvel, Loki, Scarlet Witch, Spider-Man, Black Panther, Thor, Doctor Strange, and Black Widow. Each character not only has different powers, but each character has unique components that play completely differently while sticking to the base premise of the poker hand. Their individual decks have similar base cards with cards that are unique. Their individual decks have similar base cards in addition to cards that are unique to each character. Dice Throne combines deck building and dice chucking in a luck-driven, yes, I said it, <laughs> luck-driven game that I never hesitate to play. And because I'm not a Marvel fan or a fan of luck-based games, this is thoroughly enjoyable, so it deserves to be on the top. There you go. That is our top five games of 2022. Well, Angie, I think it's time to wrap up the Christmas extravaganza. But you know what? Before we do that, we got a game to give away. We do. We do. We have a game to give away. And we brought in a special guest to announce our winner. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the one, the... Wait, 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 wait. I didn't fly all the way in from the North Pole for you to introduce him. All right. Here he is, the one, the only... Santa Claus! <laughs> okay, okay, calm down, everybody. Thanks for that introduction, Twinkle. Angie, thank you for having me on my favorite board game podcast, Chasing Meeples. <laughs> Chris, you're looking good as usual today. All right, so let's cut to the chase. You brought me in so I could announce the winner of the Horizons of Spirit Island board game giveaway. Well, here it is. Chris and Angie had entries from all over the world, and they picked a winner. And they go by the screen name Frosty Boy. So if you're Frosty Boy, check your email, because we contacted you and you should reach back out to us so you can tell us how to get you your game. Ho ho ho! Let's go, Twinkle! Angie, let's take a picture together. Mrs. Claus is never going to believe that I was on Chasing Meeples. Ho ho! Chris, give me that autograph. Oh, you promised. Let's get out of here. Please rate, follow, and review us. Please rate, follow, and review us. Please rate, follow, and review us. Chasing meeples are cool.